Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Straight Science. Straight Science is an evening science seminar series put on by University of Alaska Fairbanks Northwest Campus in Nome and UAF Alaska Sea Grant, also in Nome. But I'm not in Nome tonight. I'm We're doing this in Anchorage, and so is our speakers tonight. And, oh my gosh, harmful algal bloom. This is a, this is a uh, very important topic, something that we endured in 2020. The Bering Strait region from July to September had a massive, persistent, and honestly, dangerous level of a toxic algae called the Alexandrium. And um, tonight, we're going to hear the latest research ongoing on how seabirds react to harmful algal blooms. And this is really going to be helpful for all of us in the Bering Strait region as if we see um, if we see dead seabirds and whatnot this year. So this is going to be a really important piece of the puzzle. And with that, tonight's speakers are geneticist Matthew Smith with the U.S. Geological Survey in Anchorage. And the U.S. Geological Survey is the research arm for the Department of the Interior. Seabirds are under the Department of Interior. So things like walrus are also under the Department of Interior. So for management, it's U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. For research, it's the U.S. Geological Survey. Joining Matthew on the same screen, that's good because that'll save us some internet bandwidth issues, is Sarah Shane. She is a seabird biologist, also with the U.S. Geological Survey in the Anchorage office, Alaska Fishery Science Center. Is that correct? Alaska that's Science Center. Alaska, 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 Alaska Center. Science Center. Sorry about that. Alaska <laughs> Science Center okay. in Anchorage. So with that, I can't wait to hear your your news, your latest news and update. And we're really grateful that you guys are giving us your time uh, to clue us in. So thank you so much. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Gay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, we're excited to be here today. And I um, have multiple screens set up here all over the place. So if you see me looking off to the side like this, not at the camera, I apologize. Um, my name's Matt, and today Sarah and I are going to be telling you about harmful algal toxins in Alaskan seabirds, going over some updates, and giving you an overview of our ongoing research. So before we get started with this presentation, I need to show this disclaimer here and mention that many of the data we're presenting in this talk are preliminary and subject to revision in sometime in the future. Um, I know working with the federal government, we realize this kind of thing can sometimes move at a snail's pace. So our goal in participating in events such as this is to, in an attempt to get this information out to folks as quickly as we can. So we appreciate you bearing with us and um, it's what is sometimes a frustrating situation. All right, now, um, I'm also here with Sarah. Sorry, I got to introduce right away. And she's going to start you off now and take it from here. All right, thanks, Matt, for the introduction. I'm happy to be here with you guys tonight. Um, I'm sure it isn't news to any of you listening in here that ocean temperatures have been increasing in recent years. Um, these two figures here show the sea surface temperature anomalies for the Bering, northern Bering and Chukchi seas, and these are based on satellite data. Um, and the first figure on the left, the red lines, show you the, the deviations from normal temperatures. Um, and you can see that the red lines are occurring in the last 20 years, and then they're becoming more frequent in the last about 10 years. Um, and then in the figure on the right, that's, the, that's also the same region from 1980 through present day. And all of the little dashed lines show you marine heat waves, and the brighter red colors show you the, the warmer water. So again, they're becoming warmer more frequently in the later years. So alongside these marine heat waves, we've also, we've also seen seabird die-offs in increasing in frequency, duration, and spatial extent in Alaska. Um, and we've seen annual seabird die-offs since 2015. So this infographic on the right that Rob Kaler and Sarah Battle put together for the Arctic Report Card shows seabird die-offs from 1970 through present day. And seabird die-offs have happened sporadically in the past, but in the last about 10 years, they've really 
increased in size and frequency. And that really large circle you see is associated with the largest seabird die off ever recorded of common MERS in 2015 and 16. And that was centered in the Gulf of Alaska. And then the, the other zebra diaphs listed there were all centered in the Bering and Chukchi. Um, puffins in 2016, bull mars 2017, shearwaters in 2019, and then multiple species across a few years. And although we know that these diaphs have been with birds that were starving, we also wondered if HABs could have been involved in those diaphs. <clears throat> so most folks, um that are here have likely heard of HABs, harmful algal blooms in some way or form, red tide, paralytic shellfish poisonings, uh, amnesiac shellfish poisoning. These are all examples of algae blooms, which are events with very high or uncontrolled growth of toxin producing algae. Um, so these blooms have the potential to cause harm to a broad range of marine organisms, including humans that eat contaminated shellfish or other marine foods. Uh, they're affected by multiple environmental factors uh, wind condition, water temperature, solar radiation um, being a few examples, and they have a regular historic occurrence in Alaskan waters. So the two toxins that we're going to focus on today um, are saxitoxin and domoic acid. Uh, these are the most common that occur in Alaska and those to, um, that we study for our projects. So saxitoxin is produced by the dinoflagellate alexandrium, uh, it's the causative agent for paralytic shellfish poisoning toxin in humans and other organisms. And again, has a regular historic occurrence in Alaska as well as other parts of the world. Domoic acid is um, the causative agent for amnesiac shellfish poisoning and is produced by the diatom pseudonychia. It's present in Alaska. Uh, there hasn't been as much documented illness or death. And in our case, we have been testing for this for some time alongside saxitoxin but we haven't been detecting it very often. And when we do, it's at very low trace amounts. So while there are some statements in here referring to domoic acid, we're gonna mostly concentrate on saxitoxin because we just haven't been detecting that much in any of our samples. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our initial work um, getting started with looking at saxitoxin and seabirds. Um, so starting with that big myrrh die off in 2015-16, um, we collected a bunch of carcasses and harvested tissues from them to test for saxitoxin and domoic acid. Um, and we, in order to put those results into context, because there hadn't been much seabird work looking at algal toxins at that point, especially in Alaska, we also wanted to collect um, live, presumably healthy birds uh, to have sort of a baseline of comparison for those levels. So we also collected live birds from breeding colonies, kittiwakes and murres, um, in the summer following that die-off. And then um, in 2017, there were northern full murres that died in, in a die-off that Matt will talk about more later. So we also tested those full murres for saxitoxin. Um, and the Caroline Van Humer led a paper um, discussing those results in 2020. And that figure here on the left shows our results from that. And we did find saxitoxin in all of the species that we looked at. Um, we only had live kittiwakes. We didn't have die-off birds to compare, but we saw some quantitative levels of saxitoxin in those kittiwakes. And then MERS in the middle, um, we saw higher levels of saxitoxin in the die-off birds than we did in the live, presumably healthy birds. Um, and then northern fulmars, the axes are different for these graphs. So the northern fulmars actually had the highest levels, um, concentrations of saxitoxin in them. And those were all die-off birds, not no live birds. Um, and there was also a die-off, or a, sorry, a dosing study for um, using captive mallard ducks um, that Bob Dusek at the National Wildlife Health Center led in collaboration with folks at our center. Um, and he did that in 2018. So after that initial work, we ended up with a lot more questions than we had answers. So we, um, wrote grants and got some funding to continue our work in harmful algal blooms and seabirds. And we had four main projects that we, we moved forward with. So one is looking at saxitoxin levels throughout the marine food web. So we know a lot about um, saxitoxins in shellfish, but there, at that point, there hadn't been much work looking at saxitoxin levels in other parts of the food web. And because seabirds don't eat shellfish, most seabirds don't eat shellfish, they eat forage fish, we were wondering how, how the levels looked in the food web and how it might move through the food web. 
We also looked at saxitoxin levels in, in more live, presumably healthy birds to try to get an idea of what levels were around in the environment and what might harm birds or what might not um, in comparison to die-off birds. And then we continued um, a collaboration with the National Wildlife Health Center looking at saxitoxin levels in die-off birds to try to determine if um, toxins had been associated with their deaths. And then we also um, started a captive dosing trial of saxitoxin in common birds, which was a collaboration with the, the Alaska Sea Life Center. Okay, so I'll talk about saxitoxin in marine food webs first. Um, we collected most of our food web samples from our research vessel, the Alaskan Gyre, and we collect, uh, we have a zooplankton net for collecting zooplankton samples, and we collect oceanographic information and do midwater trawls to collect forage samples and lots of other methods. But um, the graph on the left shows uh, the different taxa in the different colors, and the left bar shows the samples that did not have any positive detections of saxitoxin. And obviously that's the, the majority of the samples did not have a detection of saxitoxin in them. And that's compared to the right hand bar, which shows the quantitative detections of saxitoxin. So shellfish had the highest detection rate, 76% of the shellfish samples had saxitoxin. So plankton were much lower at 10%. Invertebrates like shrimps uh, were about 27% positive. Our fish samples were about 22% positive, and the seabird tissues that we sampled were only positive in 9% of the cases. So we can also look at those levels. These are the quantitative levels across taxa. Um, the human consumption limit set by the FDA is shown in the, the red bar there, and that's um, 80 micrograms per 100 gram. But you can see that the shellfish have the highest concentrations in them, which isn't a surprise. Um, zooplankton and invertebrates have much lower levels. Uh, we do have a couple hotter samples of fish. Those were both sand lance samples that are one above the human regulatory limit and one just below. Um, sand lance are filter feeders and they're known to accumulate higher levels of saxitoxin. And then the seabirds in the yellow are uh, much lower. So then to break that up by region, I show the, the region that the samples came from in the colors on the right. And the samples from the Bering and Chukchi are primarily those three in the kind of purple colors on the left side of all of the, the different graphs. And then we did do sample one event in Unalaska and that's in the yellow on the right. Um, but you can see, uh, again, shellfish have the highest levels. Most of our, our hotter, Shellfish samples came from a site in Juneau, um, and then one other pretty hot sample from Unalaska from a bloom event there. And then again, our fish samples are associated with those same events, Juneau and Unalaska, and those were sand lamps. And then all of those seabirds are, are relatively low comparatively. Um, and then looking at this, um, looking at the levels for the, from the wild, um, live birds that we captured or collected. Um, again, we only saw detectable levels of saxitoxin in 9% of the bird tissues that we sampled, and the highest levels we found were in the stomach contents, so which that's the food that they're eating, in their feces, and in the uh, gastrointestinal tract. Um, and notably, no bird tissues from wild live birds were over the human consumption limit of 80 micrograms per 100 gram. So if you break this out by species, um, our, high, our highest sample was from a horn puffin stomach contents. And that was again in that Unalaska event. And then we saw another hotter level in a, in a kitty wake, um, but most of these levels are pretty low. Is that going? Okay. Um, so we also did in association with our food web study, we wanted to kind of drill down more specifically to try to figure out um, what levels were within a food web at a specific time. So we know that the, the toxin depurates out of, this, out of um, animals very quickly. So sometimes when you pick up uh, a carcass of a bird, you're not sure how recently they might, may or may not have consumed a toxin or if it's already left their system. So we wanted to target some bird die-offs and collect food web samples at as close to real time as we could to try to 
capture the event before any of the toxins changed. Um, and we also wanted to um, look, in, look at times when there weren't super high levels of saxitoxin in the environment and during known bloom events to try to nail some of these, these things down. So I'll walk you through this. Uh, we looked at Prince William Town in 2019 where there were no bird die-offs and there was not a saxitoxin bloom and we just saw trace levels of saxitoxin throughout the food web. Um, we also looked at Cook Inlet in 2019, which had kind of mid-range levels of saxitoxin in the environment. And we saw, saw it in mussels, kind of at middle range and trace levels in the fish and invertebrates, but none, none at the bird level, um, no die off. We also looked at, at known bloom events, that bloom I was talking about in Unalaska. So that had a high saxitoxin bloom. We saw high levels in mussels and fish, but and then mid levels in birds but there was not a die-off associated. Um, there was also a big high bloom in Juneau 2019, which had high levels in mussels and fish, and also pretty high levels in birds. And that one was associated with the bird die-off, Arctic terns, and those terns were determined to have died from saxitoxicosis. Um, we also looked at two different events where there were bird die-offs that did not, um, were not associated with any saxitoxin blooms. So Middleton 2021, there were, basically no saxitoxin in the food web. Um, the kitty wakes that died in that die-off were likely killed by botulism. And then in Bristol Bay 2019, that, that large um, seabird die-off that stretched throughout the bearing, uh, we saw trace levels of saxitoxin in the food web and the shearwaters that died in that event were killed by um, emaciation. Okay, so to summary, to summarize the food web and live bird results, we found saxitoxin infrequently in 11% of our samples um, throughout the marine food web, including in live birds in, in lower and mid levels of saxitoxin. Um, and we've observed higher saxitoxin levels, both with and without seabird die-offs. And we've seen mid saxitoxin levels without seabird die-offs. We've also seen seabird die-offs with no saxitoxin involvement. Um, so Matt will talk more about this later, but most seabird die-offs are not attributed to, to saxitoxin. Starvation is the primary cause. <clears throat> okay, uh, so now I'm going to move into um, what is our ongoing testing of die-off seabirds for the presence of alkyl toxins. So in late 2016, we started to develop the capacity to screen tissues for the presence of saxitoxin and demoic acid here at the Alaska Science Center. Um, we were just discussing this with Gay earlier um, before we started and all through this week at a alcohol toxin workshop, but a lot of the method methodology that goes into detecting and quantifying and breaking up these toxin profiles is very complicated. Um, so what we do is beach casts or other forms of die-off seabirds are collected either by biologists or more commonly, particularly from the Bering Strait region, community members. And these birds are typically shipped to a representative um, or by a representative, in this case, it's almost always gay, to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service here in Anchorage. And Rob Kaler, um, give him as much deserved credit, submits these carcasses to the National Wildlife, USGS National Wildlife Health Center in Madison, Wisconsin, where they undergo, ne undergo necropsy and um, other pathogen testing. Our colleagues at the National Wildlife Health Center then subsample tissues, ship them back to me here at the Science Center where we extract them for I will toxin analysis and screen them using an, an ELISA test. Any tissues that return high values above a certain threshold are then sent to NOAA in Beaufort, North Carolina for a subsequent HPLC analysis so we can get an idea on the complete toxin profiles. Um, so rather than go in the six plus years since we started this and all, we've screened several thousand samples, um, I wanna focus more on the specific results we found from the Berry and Chukchi region. Um, now, this region is no stranger to harmful algal toxins. Um, folks might remember Kathy Lafee publishing a study in 2016 that found widespread occurrence of both saxitoxin and demoic acid in marine mammals throughout the state, uh, including both healthy and beached animal, animals from the Bering and Chukchi region. Uh, there have also been annual recurring die-offs of seabirds throughout this region since 2017. And that die-off, um, uh, in 2020, Caroline Van Hemert and I presented uh, early results of our toxin analysis from die-off birds at a, one of these virtual straits, uh, 
straight science um, presentations. And these results stem largely from that 2017 die-off uh, that was included primarily northern fulmars um, with a few short-tailed shearwaters. So over 1,700 beach cast birds were found dead during this event. Uh, many of the birds appeared to have starved, but we did find what we thought at the time was abnormally high saxitoxin values in the GI tract and GI content of 60% of individual carcasses overall and 88% of die-off northern fulmars. Incidentally, this value um, here, the was 63 micrograms per 100 gram, turned out to be the highest value we've detected in any wild bird to date. Um, you can see the human regulatory limit for saxitoxin, 80 micrograms per 100 gram. It's below that, but it's still the highest concentration we found in a wild cast bird so far. Um, moving forward to 2018, um, there is another moderate scale die off um, of seabirds in the region. Uh, this involved multiple species, but we received less carcasses overall, and we didn't find any traces of saxitoxin or demolic acid in these individuals. In 2019, uh, a much larger die off event occurred, ranging all the way from the Aleutians in Bristol Bay all the way up to Point Hope. Uh, it's, I believe, near, nearly or just over 10,000 birds are estimated to have died during this event, and we received the largest number of carcasses from event to date from this, uh, during this year, uh, where we found a um, few detections of saxitoxin and demoic acid. I'll give, and um, for these, I'll give the exact numbers in a table in just a moment. Uh, moving on to 2020, there was a much smaller scale die-off of multiple species, um, and we did find tissues of two individuals that contained concentrations of saxitoxin, uh, none for demonic acid. So for the last two years, in 2021 and 2022, we received far fewer samples for alkaltoxin analysis, uh, largely due to complications from COVID-19 and the presence of high path avian influenza in the region. Many groups or organizations weren't as comfortable collecting sick or dead birds, um, that could also be because there's overlapping symptoms between high path positive individuals and those suffering um, alkaltoxin poisoning. We did receive 19 carcasses over the last two years, however, that um, contain no traces of saxitoxin. Um, yeah, so just to sum up what we found so far in the last six years in the Bering region, wading through all this depressing information for seabirds, um, Habtoxins do appear to be present in seabirds from the Bering and Chukchi region, but at a relatively low prevalence, 16.2%. Uh, now that might not seem like an insignificant value, but if you look at the table here on the right, you can see the majority of those can be attributed to that northern fulmar die-off in 2017, which knowing what we know now, those higher values I showed you earlier, those birds did work, did likely suffer saxitoxin poisoning at the time. It's, it's very hard to attribute causation to these events for this kind of toxicity. But based on what we've seen in our captive studies, we do think those birds probably did die of saxitoxin poisoning. And in subsequent years, 2018, no detections, uh, six in 2019, and then two in 2020, uh, there just isn't an overall high prevalence of these toxins in these birds. There are a few isolated die-offs that are linked to saxitoxin exposure, but there are also many additional compounding factors, ecosystem changes, and changes of food availability that um, could account for these die-offs more than allotoxin poisoning. So as we were doing all this work, um, it's from the beginning, it started to become clear early on that we didn't know a lot about what the numbers we were getting. Um, what's a high or low value or concentration of toxin in these birds? Is it over 100, 10? We didn't really know what any of these values meant. So to help to interpret these results we were getting from the field, we conducted two separate experimental trials looking at the effects of saxitoxin on birds, since that's the toxin we were detecting more commonly, and it's a much more potent toxin than demoic acid. Uh, the first was a lethal dose study in 2018 using mallards at the National Wildlife Health Center. This gave us some of the first information on the lethal levels, LD50 levels of saxitoxin in birds, as well as some of the first information on tissue routing, so where the toxin goes after the bird is ingested a known amount, and if a bird dies acutely from a certain dose, 
what we see in its tissue. So we start to get the ideas of what these wild values might mean. Uh, we also conducted a second trial last year in collaboration with the Alaska Sea Life Center using common, common MERS, where we looked more closely at sublethal effects and chronic effects of this toxin and did additional follow-up research into the tissue routing and bioconversion of toxin profiles. So results from these two studies could be their own hours long presentation. So I'm just gonna go over our main findings. Um, one of our primary goals for the MERS study in particular was to determine the behavioral changes in seabirds that have been exposed to this toxin. So if resource users, community members are out in the field, we want to be able to tell them what they might see if seabirds or if individuals are being affected by these toxins. Um, now we observed a broad range of behavior changes but not necessarily in the manner that we expected. There wasn't a gradual increase in symptoms with increasing doses. Um, MERS really showed little change until they reach higher doses. And then the symptoms would come on very suddenly, very strong. And the bird would either suffer acute toxicity very, very quickly within 15 minutes, or it would start a very rapid recovery. Uh, so for the behaviors we observed, uneasy posture and head shaking, were common regurgitation occurred in almost every instance and wing abduction, so the drooping of wings off um, a bird's body. And in more severe cases, paralysis or partial paralysis of wings, legs, or a bird's head. So in this slide, you can see up here on the top right circle, this bird was dosed with saxitoxin 34 minutes before this picture was taken. And the birds, control birds on the left there haven't had any toxin exposure. You can see this bird's having a very hard time Mobility-wise, its wings are paralyzed, its legs, legs are paralyzed, it's trying to move around, but it's having a very hard time. Um, this was just after it, after it started to recover. And you can see down here on the bottom left, 38 minutes post-inoculation or post-dosing. The bird's swimming around, it's interacting with the other individuals. You can still sing that, see that wing abduction I was referring to there, where they're drooping off the side of its body. It can't um, lock its wings together. It's still suffering partial paralysis. Fast forward to 50 minutes on the lower right, uh, its behavior is starting to get nearly indistinguishable from that of the control birds. Uh, it's swimming around, it's starting to act normal, it's hopping in and out of the water. And fast forward to 105 minutes, so under two hours after we gavage this bird with a large amount of toxin, um, you, you, its behavior was completely indistinguishable from that of the control birds. And one minute later, when we started a foraging trial and released live fish into the pen, it was the first bird to catch fish. So. This bird went from walking the razor's edge of death to recovering and catching prey in under two hours. Uh, as far as tissue results, um, they kind of fall along the lines of what we also saw in seabird carcasses. The overwhelming and highest amounts of saxitoxin seems to be combined to the GI tissue. You can see here on the bottom of this chart, large intestine, small intestine, and upper GI had high or very high values. And um, we're gonna show a table and towards the end of the talk that have some of the actual um, values. And this is true for both captive studies and also what we see in live birds. Um, kidney, heart very low, liver is very low, muscle, which is one we really wanted to look at for folks that are gonna be consuming birds for, as, from a subsistence standpoint, very low, very uh, nearly trace detections in muscle. And we didn't find, we haven't been able to detect toxin in blood, serum, or brain tissue. So one of the more interesting findings from the Mallard LD50 study was when we looked at saxitoxin concentrations in fecal samples, you can see this steep decline. So the bot x-axis here is the number of hours post-dosing. So you can see these higher values over 100 here, and then a very sharp decline between one and three hours, followed by this up and down oscillation and kind of peaks and valleys all the way out to 48 hours. So this large spike followed by a slow decline and then no toxin detected after 48 hours. So it appears that the toxin leaves their system relatively quickly. And when these birds were euthanized at 168 hours or seven days, there was no toxin detected in any of their tissues. <clears throat> so for the MERG trial in the chronic portion, we, what we wanted to know here was, are there potential sublethal effects to ingestion of this toxin? So if we know that birds in the wild can encounter very large blooms and very high concentrations of this toxin in prey. And if they uh, ingest this, uh, over a certain amount and they ingest a lethal amount, they're going to suffer acute toxicity. But 
if that isn't occurring, we wanted to know if ingestion of smaller amounts over a longer period of time could have ecologically relevant consequences that aren't based on acute toxicity. They're not, that aren't based on them just dying immediately from the consumption. So we tracked the overall mass of prey that was consumed by birds that were exposed to toxin for one week um, and compared that to control birds that didn't have any exposure. And this chart here shows one week prior, one week during, and one week after um, that exposure. And you can probably guess where in there they were ingesting toxin. So this portion here, there was a overall large decline in total prey consumption and a statistically significant difference versus the control group. So as you can imagine, if these birds were out in a wild environment and a bin, uh, marine environment in the Gulf of Alaska or the Bering and Chukchi region, and consuming lower amounts of toxin over a, a week-long period causes them to consume significantly less fish that could potentially have some severe ecological consequences. Uh, so this is a lot of information. We're dumping on you quick, so I'll try to sum up our main findings quickly. Um, I want to emphasize that while we did identify behavioral responses to saxitoxin ingestion by these birds, they may be very difficult to observe. Um, we observed these birds post each, after each dosing event for 24 hours on camera, and it was still sometimes hard for us to define these more severe cases, like I showed earlier and up here in the top right, uh, were easier to detect. But again, they came on very quickly, and they would either die or they would recover very quickly. And there's appeared to be a fine line between subtle response and acute toxicity. There wasn't a nice linear increase that we expected with increasing doses. There just was very little response up to a point, and then there was a whole lot of response and the bird either died or recovered quickly. Um, as far as overall behavior, regurgitation, head shaking, and partial paralysis appear to be the most prevalent, what you're more like, most likely to see. And again, just to stress that rapid recovery from their symptoms. So the three birds pictured here on the bottom right were all dosed just prior to these images being taken and live fish released into the pens, and they didn't have any problem hunting down and catching their prey. So they, it appears that it's almost not quite binary, but more of a black and white response than what we expected going into this study. And again, to reiterate, most of the toxin, as far as saxitoxin is confirmed or concerned, is confined to the GI tissue. Um, and it's detectable in feces for up to 48 hours post-ingestion. After that, it looks like they pretty much clear the toxin from their system. And based on our chronic results, it looks like there are potential sublethal effects that may have ecological consequences for these birds. Okay, so with that, I'm going to give it back to Sarah. Thanks, Matt. Um, so Gay and others have um, expressed a lot of interest in knowing how um, toxin levels in seabirds might impact consumers. And USGS isn't a regulatory agency, so we're not, we can't make recommendations related to food safety, but we do want to help relay some of the lessons that we've learned and hope that that can help inform safe consumption. Um, so a few takeaways here, seabirds don't appear to bioaccumulate saxitoxin, not like bivalves. Um, saxitoxin, saxitoxin concentrations are highest in the GI tract of birds, wild and dosed. Paralysis, regurgitation, and seizures can indicate that a bird has ingested large levels of toxins. And it's important to note that those same behaviors can overlap with a lot of different causative agents. So they could indicate a different kind of illness too. Um, and seabirds appear to, to suffer acute toxicity quickly after ingesting lethal levels of saxitoxin. And then to summarize uh, the, the results from our wild birds found alive, wild birds found dead, and the dose captive birds. These are all the maximum concentrations for each tissue type. Um, and these are again, micrograms per 100 gram. And a reminder that that human regulatory limit is 80. Um, you can see that the highest levels are again in that GI tract. So feces, GI tissue, GI content. Um, and the only, only levels that we have tested that were above the human regulatory limit were in dosed captive birds in their GI tissue. And these birds were of course dosed with high levels of saxitoxin. So we are hoping, we recently reached out to the Department of Epidemiology and we're hoping to planning on meeting with uh, 
those epidemiologists and also um, members of the Bering Strait region, Gay and Emma Pate, and hopefully um, some other folks to try to um, summarize some of these results and get the Department of Epidemiology's input on some kind of guidelines for safe consumption that could hopefully be applicable. So to summarize overall, all these different pieces, um, we've found saxitoxin throughout marine food webs. Saxitoxin is present in about 9% of the live birds that we've looked at. And from all of our die off birds, it's only been present in 7% of the samples. Um, we haven't detected saxitoxin in concentrations over that human regulatory limit in wild birds. Um, most die offs are attributed to starvation but there are a few that are presumed to be caused by saxitoxin, and those are pretty localized acute events. Um, birds dosed with high levels of saxitoxin have behavioral modifications and either died quickly or recovered quickly. And again, saxitoxin levels are highest in the GI tract of birds. So since we've learned that most of these die-offs are not related to toxins, um, but we know that they have been associated with marine heat waves, I wanna just quickly summarize some of the, the recent um, findings that we've uh, found with marine heat waves and seabirds. So of course, die-offs can, really, can relate to um, reduced population sizes. And we've also seen that marine heat waves can influence the distribution of birds so they can move um, in space to try to follow food. Um, in that bottom left picture, you can see a myrrh that's really skinny. So in, in the Gulf of Alaska, we found myrrhs that were in abnormal body condition, really emaciated, were attending breeding colonies and attempting to breed, which is really unusual. Um, that's in comparison to the bird on the right in a more normal body condition. Um, we've seen a lot lower colony attendance following these heat waves and decreased breeding attempts. And then even amongst that lower breeding population, we've seen declines in reproductive success. And that's a lot of times related to increased predation. So this is all related to food security. Um, marine heat waves are not doing good things for bird populations. And it's still sort of unknown how much or if uh, saxitoxin and other biotoxins could be an additional stressor um, from the captive study Matt seen that they, you know, when there's toxins present in food, it can really reduce their consumption rate and um, lead to potential starvation too. So it's something that we want to continue looking into. <clears throat> so as far as future directions are concerned, um, harmful algal blooms are expected to be and I guess already are an emerging and important issue with climate change. And we know there is a potential for large saxitoxin or alexandrian bloom events in the Bering Strait region based on the work done recently by Don Anderson and his group out of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Um, for our work, um, we're gonna continue monitoring saxitoxin levels in die-off events, as well as continued monitoring of saxitoxin in live birds, and also to monitor for saxitoxin throughout food web in the events of a known accessible bloom event or a large die-off, so a response to bloom events to try to get more of a handle on these dynamics. Uh, if folks are interested um, for more information, you can go to the Alaska Science Center website or you click on the, or use the link here on the page that will take you directly to the harmful algal bloom toxin and Alaska seabirds page, where we have a lot of information on the work we're doing, publications and related science and any data that we release. Uh, you can contact myself or Sarah. Our email address is here, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. And with that, we want to thank a large thank you to the community members from the Bering Strait region. Um, this would be very hard, difficult to, to do without your input and your collection of carcasses and submission. Uh, we have a large group of collaborators from all over the country on these projects, National Wildlife Health Center, NOAA, Alaska Sea Lab Center and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, just to name a few, and all the funding and any kind of support from other groups. And with that, we can take anybody's questions. All right, wow. Thank you so much. And um, at this point, Charlie, I see your hand. While everyone's thinking of their questions, we'll, we'll go to Charlie. But while Charlie's asking his questions, make sure you give uh, Sarah Shane and um, I am so tired. I just, Matthew Smith, 
some love in the chat box. It is never easy to be a public speaker. And they did a fine job. And I am just so impressed with the amount of information you were able to deliver there and that you guys are on the hunt for this. That was, there's a lot to um, take in and I'm excited to go through that again. So with that, Charlie Lean, you're up at bat. Well, thanks. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Um, I, it's great that you're working on those, those uh, different bird species. I, one of the species here that pretty much subsists totally on on shellfish is uh, spectacle eider, and and they're they frequent uh, a portion of Norton Sound where the bottom's just covered in in uh, in snails, whelks. And they, uh, they eat a lot of those. And I wondered if you had any news about eiders and or whelks having uh, having saxitoxin. We we the people here eat those too. So the whelks. So great. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've received any. I think I've received two spec okay. eiders um, over the last few years. Uh, not didn't find any toxin in either of them. But yeah, it is surprising. Sometimes there are some species that subsist almost completely on bivalve species that we know consume or, um, or often have very high values of sax toxin. Um, scoter species in South, um, South Central, especially that we haven't seen or haven't found any evidence of die off events from them consuming hot blue mussels as they consume almost exclusively blue mussels. So, that is a question that we've had and talked about looking into down the road for certain species. But um, yeah, besides the two eiders from that were sent from that region, that's all the information I have on that species. We the black oyster catcher um, levels because they also eat a lot of shellfish, um, and those have had detectable levels, but really not very high, like five and below. Um, so yeah, it is interesting. It, it would be reasonable to assume that some species might have some kind of ability to handle toxins, but I really don't, I don't think we have any evidence. Yep, that's all when I was a late teenager, I got a bunch of clams near Peril Strait in Southeast Alaska, named after a saxophoxin event. All the Aleut hunters died. Uh, anyway, I, I ate a big clam chowder of that, and suffered no effects. I gave half my catch to a friend who fed it to his cat and the cat promptly died. Uh, wow. So uh, maybe I'm different, but anyway, that was, uh, the, I did make a mistake and, and I ended up having to reconstitute the broth in the, because I poured curdled milk in it and perhaps curdled milk or the fact that I poured off all the liquid and started over with the same clams saved my life, but uh, the cat was dead in no time at all. So anyway. Yeah, there is, um, it's very much based on mass. So the bigger organism can the much higher amount of toxin than smaller, but typically in those cases, like some of the concentrations in mussels or clams are really high. So it's not as effective, but in that case, yeah, maybe that was based on the amount of toxin and the size difference. Yeah, just just luck. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, okay. size. Yeah. Wow, that was, sounds like a close call, Charlie. Um, we do have a caller on the line. They they can join in at any time. So, caller, if you have a question, just feel free to join in. If you are having trouble unmuting, which might be star six. Um, you can also call or text me at 907-434-1149. Um, so you have priority caller because it's never easy to be a caller on a Zoom call. You can't do anything. You just have to sort of blurt out there. So feel free to text or unmute if you can. There has been problems with that uh, recently. So, all right. There is a question in the chat. And that is, is there funding to sample mussels for levels of HABs and whatever? And um, this individual came in late, so you may just want to give a quick um, overview. Toby, are you in Gullivan? So if you could reiterate maybe the, the different tissues that you had 
tested and where the saxitoxin was more likely to be found. I think that if you could was just- Was asking if muscle tissue or muscles is in the bivalve muscles? Uh, in the bird, probably, that, yeah. the, that when mm -hmm. you are, it, it is, it's the question, is there funding for sampling? And you guys have actually sampled the muscles. Okay, he can't get off mute. Yeah, in the birds. So there, there was, mm -hmm. while Matthew calls up his slide, Toby, know that they did some of that and that was um, mentioned. So we'll go back to that because it's really important. And he, they looked at muscle and you're going to have to share screen too, I guess. Oh, yeah, I can do that. Muscle and liver, kidney, intestine, that kind of thing. So, so stand by one, he'll show and walk us through that again. Really good question. These guys were on that. You guys see this? Yeah, we're looking at you scrolling through. Yeah, so we sample muscle um, all from the beginning um, for all live die off birds as well as um, all the birds in our captive trials. And we found very low, basically trace amounts of it in all categories of birds. So, yeah, we can show you the exact numbers down here. So you can see the maximum values we've seen in muscle and live birds found alive. So something that you might hunt or harvest for three micrograms per hundred gram, two in birds that were found dead, and then only one microgram per hundred gram in birds that were dosed. And these are birds that I gavaged pure toxin into their stomach just prior to this. So they received very high doses. In this case, from you know unofficial results, if a bird ingest the lethal amount, it dies so fast from, you know, our current theory is that it doesn't have time to go through its body and it, it, it's a very, very strong paralytic toxin. So it starts to paralyze certain other organ, organs in the body before it reaches the muscle. And we just haven't seen high values in any other species in any of other our samples. So as far as muscle is concerned, it doesn't appear that that's where this toxin really resides in birds that are consuming it. That answers your question. Hope that answers your question, Toby. Um, they did test a whole bunch of things and it looked like the highest was in the guts. So stay away from that. Um, OA, I see OPIC, you have your hand up. Go ahead and we'll get to your chat question, Rob, right after. Go ahead, OPIC. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a couple questions. One of them is um, with your zooplankton collections, uh, what species are you collecting um, in the Bering Sea? So we, I don't think we have any zooplankton samples in the Bering Sea is the easy answer. Um, we're doing bulk zooplankton toes. So I haven't uh, identified them down to species. It's just kind of a slurry from our net. Um, can you show me this one? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but we have, um, we also get uh, Upausids, krill. Um, I was lumping those, I think, into invertebrates in, in some of those comparisons, but um, I haven't analyzed many samples. It, we haven't analyzed many samples from the Bering Chukchi except for the die off birds, but I'm always interested. So if you have a sample, you can send it to me and I'll, I'll test it. <laughs> okay. Um, and the next question is with the saxitoxins in the live birds. I mean, with collecting um, samples uh, from birds, whether they're live or dead, um, well, let's do the live one first. So with the live birds, what uh, materials or steps and equipment are you using to collect these samples? Great question, yeah. So some of the samples in the beginning, we actually shot birds, so we shot about 15 or 20 MERS and kittiwakes because we wanted to look at all the tissues. Um, so, and, and then we shot um, some glaucous wing gulls, some horned puffins and kittiwakes during that Unalaska bloom as well. Um, again, to look at all of the tissues. At that point, we had learned that the, um, the highest levels are found in the GI tract. So you can't get that without shooting a bird, unfortunately. But we've also done a lot of collection of um, feces samples when we capture birds. So I think I had a picture in there somewhere, but normally we use noose poles. Um, so we'll go to the colony and extend this big 
pull with a monofilament noose at the end of it and you put it around their neck and pull them off and it's it doesn't seem to be painful and you know we we do a lot of things to the birds we measure them and um, take different kinds of samples but we'll collect their poop and test that and that's a non-invasive way to get a sample from them and then sometimes birds like kittiwakes will regurgitate what they've stored in their pro ventriculus so we're able to get um, some diet samples that way too okay um so i'm gonna be on dime throughout the whole summer and um one of the things i want to be involved in you know besides my <clears throat> excuse me my my king crab project is to um throughout the summer is to continue to collect phytoplankton samples mm -hmm. oa samples you know all the good water sampling stuff and then also um to continue to if there were if we were to find dead birds to collect them and send them into gay, I've done it a few times before, but then I, I want to be involved in collecting samples from live birds. Awesome. And if I, I've written down um, Matthew's email address and I'll probably, I, I <laughs> didn't take enough time to write yours down, but if you can give me um, a list of proper material or equipment I could use yeah. you know and um we can maybe hold a meeting and maybe we create a if you have a manual i can follow i do um, i i would like to uh you know participate in collecting samples that's fantastic thank you so much i'll send you a whole sampling kit and yeah well, that would be great um awesome your email gay, from gay gay knows my gay knows how to contact me yeah i'll get you guys hooked in Perfect. so um Thanks so much, Opic. That's that's yep. awesome. Who knows what we're going to see this summer? So it's I'm um, I'm excited you're going to be on the island both for water sampling and for for uh, helping out with the birds. Yep. Awesome. yep. Thank, thanks, guys. Thank you. And Rob Kaler had a question. Um, what was the lethal dose level for the MERS? So that is a complicated question. Um, <clears throat> so we calculated a lethal dose for the mallards of 167 micrograms per kilogram, um, which is different from the 80. You can't compare that uh, directly with the 80 microgram per 100 gram value that the FDA set for human consumption. For our MERS study, we were looking at um, what was called an ED50 value as opposed to an LD50, the effective clinical dose. So what we thought would be a dose that would cause birds to die without suffering acute toxicity, what would cause enough paralysis for them to drown or what would cause them to not be able to um, forage for food um, die acutely. So, and we also, we also use two separate toxin types in this study, a purified sax. So we, when I say saxitoxin, it's kind of a misnomer. It should be saxitoxins. There's 57 known analogs of um, identified so far for saxitoxins. So there's a very broad range of these paralytic shellfish toxins. Um, when we use saxitoxins, consider the most potent. Um, so we use a purified saxitoxin as well as a crude Alexandrium isolate that was provided by Don Anderson that was actually, he harvested from the Bering Strait region and then grew the cells in his lab and extracted the toxin and sent to us. So for the purified toxin, our ED50 value is 89 micrograms per kilogram. So if a bird, so let's say we, a MER is one kilogram, if it ingests 89 micrograms of toxin, it's very likely going to die, whether ac acutely or through indirect means, starvation or drowning. Um, and based on our results, the LD50 probably isn't far above that. We didn't calculate an official LD50 for that purified toxin, but the birds that we dosed with just over 100 micrograms died very, very quickly. For the Alexandrium isolate, um, which was given in equivalent doses, so it was a comparatively weaker uh, slew of toxins, but in that case, you give everything based on a saxitoxin equivalent dose. So since it was a weaker um, group of congeners, they received a larger volume as opposed to a smaller volume for the purified toxin. So it should have been an equivalent, the toxicity should be equivalent. 
And for that, the ED50 that we calculated was 366 micrograms. Two of the birds at the upper doses died, so that was actually the LD50 for that isolate was 366. And that's one of the things we're trying to chase down now is why was there a big difference between the purified toxin and that Alexandrium isolate? They were all given at equivalent doses, so they should have been very close. And that's one of the really interesting things we're trying to follow up on in the future. That was a very long explanation for a very short question. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> No, that that's really great. Thanks. And I guess my follow up question is, do you know, I mean, so if I'm if I'm if a mer consumes a tainted meal, and then they're sick for two hours, but then um, how long is it potentially uh, might be exposed to another round? Like, I guess if they eat another sick uh, talk, you know, another tainted meal, then um, then they're gonna especially if there's actually wave action, and they're gonna drown. But your thoughts on like how long it might persist in the environment and you can just shoot from the hip and well, I won't hold you to a fact, but I'm just wondering if you had any idea about that. Yeah, so that's a really good question. And one thing we kind of tried to get at with the chronic study where we dosed them um, for a week and with toxin ingested in the fish, um, we wanted to know, so if they don't get exposed to a lethal level in one dose, can they consume three doses below a lethal level in a certain period of time and reach that lethal threshold. Um, that was the current thought of what, you know, they could consume prey, you know, if a merc can eat multiple dozens of prey a day and they all have a low level, can they reach that lethal threshold? And what we found, they would consume toxic fish, eat more fish on top of that, violently regurgitate everything all over the pen, and then go back to business as usual, like nothing had happened and repeat the thing, the same thing in the afternoon. We fed them several times a day. Um, so it looks like if they don't receive a lethal dose right away, they're going to be fine. They're going to just keep regurgitating, but that gets us into, okay, they didn't eat very much over that week long period. They also have this really cool adaptation, you know, wings so that they can fly if they're ex uh, to a different location if they're exposed to toxic prey in the wild. But that is the one thing we couldn't model in our study was they were in enclosed pens, they couldn't fly. So they were doing all this in a, a small area. So directly to your question, these blooms can be very, very large, um, but some of these birds, and Sarah has more information on that, will forage over a large area. So if they leave the area where the, they're consuming toxic prey, they could theoretically get away from um, the bloom. But as they're consuming the toxic prey to begin with, their ability to fly, I would guess, because we haven't been able to look at this, is probably reduced. So that's one of the ideas and what kind of spurred this second study was, well, we need to know more about the sublethal effects because they might not just have to kill them outright. They may, and based on our, that 89 microgram dose, they're very likely going to drown. We had to keep each of the birds at that dose from drowning in their pens in, at the Sea Life Center. So. They're probably not going to survive in a while with that dose. And Rob, you probably know that a lot of the birds that were necropsy to the National Wildlife Health Center are the proximate cause of death can be drowning. So it's hard to tease apart these different things. Also, um, a bunch of these die-offs are associated with big storms. So it seems like there's a possibility that you know cumulative effects and multiple stressors can add up together to make a bad end for a bird but it's just hard to tell what, what is playing a bigger effect. And yeah, they, they appear to have a fair amount of resiliency, but I'm sure there's, there's an end point to that too. Yep, excellent presentation. Um, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Matt. All right. So Dean Stockwell, Opic, you have your hand up, but I think that's, is that residual? Just kind of, and then Dean, just hopped off. Okay, he must, he'll maybe I'm try to here. come back on. Oh, Dean, you're oh, there. I'm sorry, you're sort of disappearing on me. Go ahead. First of all, nice talk, really appreciated it. One problem I've always had with the analysis of the bird die-offs, you have birds dying from emaciation and birds dying from toxicity. All the symptomology of a toxin you have the bird drooping its head. It's unable really to fly well. It's regurgitating. It's probably defecating at a higher rate too, even though you didn't mention that. How long does it take 
for a bird basically to starve to death under those conditions. So all of a sudden you can't detect the levels of toxin, but you have a bird that died from starvation. Is that a matter of days or high metabolic animals, right? Yes, mm -hmm. John Pyatt talked about that in his 2020 paper about the murdi off. Um, he calculates <clears throat> it's four to five days. If a bird, if a murd can't eat 50% of its body mass a day, over four or five days, it'll start to death. Right, so I'm eating, a, I'm eating a zooplankton every day and it's making me sick. And over the course of a week, I haven't really been able to consume much. I've been sick. Um, I, I guess what I'm looking for, is there another way of testing maybe a metabolic breakdown component of the saxitoxin that you can find in those birds? I mean, I, I'm sure Good people question. have looked. Um, that's a, I haven't found any information on a, mel uh, like a metabolite that you can test for. Uh, the problem with saxitoxin is it appears to, and this is um, true for human cases of paralytic shellfish poisoning too, there's an acute phase, um, it's a very potent toxin, but once an organism passes that acute phase, it's not like domoic acid that uh, can accumulate and cause uh, long-term effects. If you survive through that, it's over, you recover and then it leaves your body as water soluble. It gets out of your system very quickly. So that's one thing we looked at. It looks like 48 hours, somewhere between 48 hours and a week, you're not gonna be able to detect that at all, even if it received a relatively near lethal dose. So it's a really difficult thing to nail down and look at, and especially in the wild where, you know, there's this huge area and birds move a long distance. And that's a really difficult question. And Rob added um, dehydration as well for the, well, for you, Dean. Yeah, I understand. Yep. Um, and then the, the gnome, did that answer your question, Dean? Yes, it did. They did a great job. All righty. And then Megan Gannon with the gnome nugget is asking, apologies if I missed this in the beginning, but is this research being published in a journal or will it be? Yeah, there's been some of it published. Um, three or four publications so far um, on the first captive study and some of the results from die-off birds and healthy birds. Um, we have a couple of projects, my most recent project and Sarah's two projects that are still in the final phases. So it, our hopes is to publish the rest of it in journals here in the coming near future. Megan, if you go to uh, that Alaska Science Center website that we've put on and we can type it in the chat too, um, it'll have the list of publications associated. I'll put That's that awesome. right here. My question is that the violent regurgitation, I mean, is that something that the birds are unique in that behavior? So it seems like if you eat something high and you're sort of like whoop in and out and, you, and they get it out quickly, is that commonplace for the other hab victims? You know, if there's, if there's, uh, other animals or other kinds of birds like um, geese or something? I don't know. Um, that's, that's a good question because alcids species, you can weigh in on this. They don't regurgitate often. That's what I always thought, but I think they will. They I, will, yeah. Yeah, I think obviously they can. Um, but some species like fulmars are kind of nicknamed pukers because they regurgitate as like a self-defense thing, the, the chicks puke a lot, okay. regurgitate their fish, you know, a lot of um, layerids regurgitate, but alcids don't, you know, they carry their fish to their young as whole fish. Um, and they, so they don't regurgitate normally, but it, they clearly can. Okay. But I couldn't that be, couldn't that be like when they're, when they're you know, vomiting right away, you know, that's a symptom of, um, you know, a dinophyces being present in their system. Isn't that correct? That again, I'm right. sorry. You know, the, the uh, harmful algal bloom dinophyces, the symptoms of uh, dinophyces is, you know, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. Yeah, I think it, I don't have any of that, but it seems like it could be very hard to differentiate. Yeah, in this case, the vomiting isn't from, I don't, it's, it happens so quickly there. I mean, it's like a defense mechanism. It looks like the mallards did the same thing. The mallards actually regurgitated faster and, you know, mallards 
grow up a lot more commonly than um, MERS do. Uh, MERS seem to have a much harder time. It was like a full body um, movement for them to get, because uh, they're such an upright, tall species. They really had to work hard to throw up all this toxin. And it was violent. It's not like it was a, they're just sitting there and kind of puking calmly. I mean, their whole body is shaking and they're flailing their head around. And, you know, we had to wear full body hazmat suits because they would regurgitate pure toxin all over us during this. And um, yeah, it was, a, but it seemed like we didn't um, quantify this at all, but the faster and more a bird okay with waiting while these guys at the high awesome. levels, the more likely it was to survive, so. Okay, and then, so with that, I, I would, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm thinking that, you know, I'm sure you're, you're uh, seeing other species, you know, of toxin under the microscope, right? The, the different species, oh, are you, are you are, when you're finding these different species of toxins under the microscope, are you noting of, taking note of these different species that you're finding? So we're doing, we're not doing microscopy for these, we're just detecting the toxin oh. itself. Um, so we're using um, uh, molecular methods and uh, immunoassays to detect the toxins as opposed to microscopy to detect the actual algae itself. Okay. Yeah, they're looking for the toxins, right? You guys are really focused in on the toxin portion. There are, yeah, there are other groups that do a lot of phytoplan um, phytoplankton monitoring up here. We're just not one of them. And I, I asked my regurgitation defense uh, question because that's what I do with beets, it seems. <laughs> so, so, um, so I just thought that maybe if there's some sort of, you know, the animals are have a way of telling that, and that is really would be interesting actually if the seabirds are extra good at that. And yeah, what, and there's what, a, we, what talk, in on? we talked a little bit about this at the workshop. <clears throat> you know, we're seeing this in our controlled studies where we're, you know, and we're they're fasted and then we're gavaging pure toxin into their system. Um, so they're getting, their system is being shocked dramatically um, all of a sudden. But there are some observational studies on other species, I believe gulls and sea otters, where they would, they kind of expose them to locations where they knew the clams were toxic and they would either spit out or start eating and then spit out the toxic clams. So whether they can, we don't have data or any way to say for sure that they can like, okay, this is toxic, I'm gonna eat this one and this one's fine, but that would be an interesting study to do down the road. Um, it would be something you'd have to set up in a more controlled setting than what these previous studies have done where they've just recorded kind of anecdotal observations. But yeah, it'd be interesting if that is the case. And I know that, um, you know, it came up in our meeting that we were recently at, you know, the myth of sea otters. How do they, do they know? And if so, how do they know about the clams that might be, if that's even a, if that's a myth or true? And if so, what's the, what do they key in on? But anyway, um, Dean Stockwell, I see your hand is back up. Go ahead. Yeah, I had another question. Uh, the human regulatory limit, you keep quoting is 80 and I know there's a lot of leeway in that, uh, just for safety features. Is there a way you can create an avian regulatory limit? And the reason I'm asking this also is that acute uh, PSP poisoning in a human ultimately results in a respiratory failure. They put people on respirators. So a lot of these drowned birds you're seeing may be a result of PSP intoxication where their lungs are shutting down. And I, you know, I'm just asking you to look into that. I don't expect an answer, but uh, keep, keep working at it. Appreciate it. Sure, thanks. Yeah, there's a lot more questions than mm -hmm. answers as we get, keep going, but these are all good ideas. Thanks. All right, with that, I don't see any other questions. Nothing in the chat. You got some kudos and a nice, um, uh, Rob Kaler was sharing his affinity for beets as well. Um, and with that, we really want to thank you. I mean, that, this is a lot of information and it's a lot of information that we need. And I think it's, it's going to be incredibly helpful as we go into the summer. Also, 
for the next straight science won't be until the 13th of April. So we're going to take a week and then we're going to come back April 13th and it's going to be um, Matthew and Sarah's colleague at the USGS and that is Andy Ramey. And he's going to be talking about highly pathogenic avian influenza in birds. And so he that will be the one-two punch here is a harmful algal bloom followed by avian influenza. These are both really important topics as bearing straight heads into the spring. I don't know if, if um, people know so much in the region that we've had uh, mer, a mer was photographed dead, fresh dead in the snow at Shishmaref, February 26. Diomede actually had reported the last week of February, there were both uh, eider ducks and mers swimming around in open water. And then recently on the 21st, there's a mer, there's actually 21st and 26th, there are two mers that were handed in in Nome. Both were live birds. Uh, one was killed by ravens and was immediately um, collected, and the other was picked off picked up off the ice and subsequently died in a box. So those have been in freezers and are waiting for my return to get them back to uh, where they need to go to get analyzed. So we're going to have on April 13th, Andy Ramey, he's going to also talk about um, avian influenza, another problem might be, that might be arriving to our region <clears throat> again as like last year. So hopefully Matthew and Sarah will also, why don't you guys make sure you attend that because I think it'll be really interesting. There might be a a whole sure. lot of questions on on kind of differences maybe or what, what we should get ready for. With that, we'll see you all next week and uh, we'll be, or not next week, we'll see you on the 13th. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much.